Henry Moore was born in 1898. He has been a practicing sculptor for more than 50 years. No collection of modern art in the world is complete without something that he has done. He is not a maker of statues. Culture as such has a much wider meaning. We know that the art of painting is partly about color and composition. Ideas about sculpture are not so clear. Whatever it is that sculpture may represent, the language of sculpture is expressed in terms of form, mass, balance, and a sense of touch. We inherit these senses from childhood. Moore knows how to use them and how to express them in an adult world. He likes to show his work out of doors, amongst the fields and trees where it was made. He has almost always lived in the country and his home and the studios around it are in a beautiful setting some 20 miles from London. His work has developed in many different ways. His largest pieces fill a hangar 30 foot high. They dwarf the man who made them. These immense forms shaped in white plastic are waiting to be finished and then cast in bronze. Sometimes the peace of the countryside is disturbed by the sounds of cranes and heavy lorries bringing work back from the foundry or from exhibitions abroad. This one was carrying 30 tons of it, a load easily worth a quarter of a million pounds. One crate held a single bronze which had cost 25,000 pounds to make. A barn is packed to the roof with crates. They hold only part of his work, his own copies and possessions constantly going out on loan. The time has gone when art lovers travelled to the objects of their admiration. Now art comes to them. The grand tour covers the world. Michelangelo was spared the problem. There were no art exhibitions then. Airlines, shipping agents, combine with a network of museums and dealers to serve a universal hunger for cultural experience. It was not always like this. Moore is now in his 70s. He was 43 before he had his first retrospective exhibition. He was 50 when he won the Sculpture Prize at the Venice Biennale. He received the Order of Merit at 65, at an age when some men retire to prune roses in their gardens. He has, of course, gone on working. His first little studio next to his house is where he still likes to be the most. It was once the village shop. It is a quiet place. This is where ideas take shape and form. Around his home, there are many other studios and storage places. Seeing the great variety of shapes and forms that have resulted from his ideas, one looks for some underlying factor which accounts for this drive, this deep concern for continual artistic self-expression. Like Michelangelo or Cezanne, Moore has given a lifetime to the pursuit of an idea. Cezanne spoke of his own indefinable dreams of solidity. Moore has a similar obsession with the firm structures of the world we know. It is a quality which informs everything that he does and almost everything that he possesses. Growth, form, strength, solidity, energy, life, power. Moore's preoccupations result in massive statements, sometimes majestic in their thrust and sweep and their sheer size. Yet big ideas begin with simple observations. In 1972, as he was preparing for the biggest exhibition of his life, the upheaval in his studios made it impossible for him to get on with sculpture. He began drawing instead and returned to an old obsession. This resulted in something which has never been shown to the public before. These are the pages of his most recent sketchbook. I've always been fascinated by sheep. I think there's something about sheep which um, no other animal, uh, for me, has quite that ancient biblical um, quality. And I began drawing the sheep, just merely uh, because I couldn't do my sculpture. Not because I intend doing um, uh, um, a sculpture of sheep, but merely because I enjoy drawing. Uh, and I enjoy sheep. So that um, 
for two or three weeks while the packing was going on, um, I came down here each day and drew the sheep. And one of the things that I found one could do that by, um, if they came near the window, by tapping on the window, the sheep couldn't see inside because it's darker in here than it is in the field, but they were curious, they could hear, and they'd stand even for five minutes, just looking in this way, just looking uh, through, trying to find out where the noise came from, and they'd stay like that for nearly five minutes, giving me the chance to draw them. Same. So, but gradually, I got to understand the shape of the sheep better through, through drawing them. To begin with, they were just round, fluffy, lumps, balls of, of wool, it seemed. But underneath that, one discovered that, of course, there is the, uh, uh, the skeleton and the, and the form of the sheep. And gradually, I went on drawing them. I understood the shape of the sheep. Now I find that I can draw for its own sake, and not as I used to, with a, an ultimate motive in the drawing of using it for sculpture. Now I can draw um, and just enjoy uh, the, uh, the drawing, just enjoy drawing from life, drawing from nature. Yeah, but I shall finish this probably as a kind of life cycle of sheep, because after this period, which I miss by being in Italy, there's a period when the sheep are shorn, and then they become entirely different creatures. I saw it happen, but I wasn't able to spend the time drawing. But um, so that the remainder of the book, I hope, will be finished and uh, uh, completed with a whole year's cycle of sheep. He has always been interested in animals. There are pictures of horses and goats in his earliest sketchbooks. This interest has continued throughout his life. His feeling for animals is as much a part of his artistic makeup as his much better known interests in bones, in stones, and in the human figure. But there's such a similarity between uh, humans and animals. There's so, so, such a big connection that one can't be interested in one and not the other. But um, animals can teach you all sorts of things about form, about uh, sculptural form, which um, uh, you wouldn't get examples of uh, so clearly from anything else. For example, uh, the um, gorilla guy at the zoo, but I often uh, studied uh, the gorilla. And for me, the gorilla has more sense of power, of physical strength, than a lion or a tiger or uh, other animals that people ordinarily think is, are, um, uh, are more ferocious and more um, well, stronger. But the, um, the gorilla, especially the back view of the gorilla, it, to me, that's the essence of physical strength, of tremendous um, pent-up uh, reserve uh, power. Um, an elephant, for instance, is very different. Uh, an elephant, again, has this power, but there's a kind of gentle um, slowness uh, and a, um, uh, an enormous... Uh, you feel that that could stand uh, forever, that that's a rock. Whereas other animals, like the gibbons that we looked at, they're the essence of, of uh, length, uh, the, the, the length of arm, the agility, all this. And, and um, uh, a visit to the zoo, for me, is a tremendous excitement. Well, there are no animals one doesn't like, really, but there are some which are not uh, so uh, attractive. Or, um, for, for example, the, um, the rhinoceros, to me, uh, compared with the elephant, the rhinoceros is a very um, uh, aggressive uh, look to it. It's like a tank that's going to attack. It's some um, uh, 
So that uh, th these kind of... Um, and, and it's all brought about by form and the relationship of the form, the sizes with each other, and the um, direction of form, so that in a, um, in a rhinoceros, the tusk, uh, or so-called tusk, but it's a hairy um, formation, that is a most aggressive um, implement, like some uh, uh, shortened sword. One of Moore's most treasured possessions is a magnificent elephant skull given to him by his friend, the zoologist Sir Julian Huxley. And when the skull arrived, and I saw it in full daylight and had it in my studio and could look at it continuously, then I realised it was a remarkable object, that I'd never seen a single unit of, of skeleton, a bone, that had such a complex uh, and such variety uh, such examples of thinnesses, of heavy thicknesses, of strength, of delicacy. Uh, in fact, much, much more complicated than a human skull. Then um, I wanted to do a, um, a series of etchings at one period, and into my mind came the idea of making uh, direct drawings onto the etching plate, and instead of drawing into a notebook or into a sketchbook, or onto the um, drawing board of paper, I drew on the uh, copper plates, direct from the elephant skull. One, one sees the things that you're conditioned to see. Uh, probably if I'd have been shown this elephant skull as a young sculptor in, um, in, in the 20s, um, I wouldn't have found it as fascinating and as interesting as I do now. And probably I'm seeing in it uh, some of my own sculptural problems and um, interest now and picking them out, uh, I don't think I'd have been able to do the, that series of etchings 30 years ago. See? I mean, we, we, we just learn to, to, to see things. And this, I think, is one of the functions of sculpture. Both of the sculptor himself is that he's learning to, to see and find things uh, in the world, in nature, uh, in his own makeup, all this. Uh, but it's also one of the functions, I think, of sculpture to let, to, to point out to other people things which they might otherwise not notice. Well, as a young sculptor, I often had a sculptural idea uh, which I drew um, to, real, to, um, uh, to fix it, and sometimes to work it out. And the drawings in, in, in the 20s and 30s, um, my drawings, looking back at them, uh, a sculpture idea was often so fully worked out that uh, I'm staggered myself that the sculpture was such an absolute um, replica of the drawing. And uh, this was all right. It was a good thing because by uh, doing a lot of drawings and probably only uh, a few of them being turned into uh, realised as sculpture, it was like having, getting a lot of experience um, of, of ideas without the time needed that you need in sculpture to carry them out. A little bit like, um, I mean, I think the world has gained enormously through the Pope making Michelangelo do the Last Judgment and the Sistine Chapel paintings. Because Michelangelo was doing in one day with a painting, or uh, really the same as a drawing, uh, a sculptural idea that he might have been spending a year so that we have uh, uh, 2,000, 3,000 more sculpture ideas from Michelangelo than we would have done if he hadn't uh, uh, painted the Sistine Chapel. Now I believe that sculpture, uh, that its main advantage or difference from painting is that it can have hundreds of points of view. And I now want to make sculpture which not, no one drawing could tell you what it's like that you'd have to have 30 or 40 drawings from above, from underneath, from the side, from everywhere. That is, I now want to make sculpture which you, you can't draw. In his studio, Moore is concerned with his own work, but in his home in recent years, he has got together a fine collection of painting and sculpture of which his own pieces form only a small part. He has always been deeply appreciative of certain works of art, whatever the period in history or the culture from which they came. 
he finds in them qualities which obviously relate to his own work as well. When he talks about his collection, his direct appreciation of artistic merit comes from a very practical knowledge of what is what. His living room is dominated by a beautifully carved Romanesque pulpit. This we, we found, I found um, in London in a, um, uh, a gallery and um, I liked it uh, very much indeed because although I don't think it's a, um, a very uh, what, sophisticated or um, it's a provincial work but um, it has such uh, simplicity and innocence in it you can feel that um, the sculptor who made that believed in the whole story uh, completely of um, uh, the flight into Egypt and it represents um, Joseph and Mary being told by the angel to take the child and uh, flee. But it has this complete uh, peaceful innocence of and happiness in it that is um, for me a continual pleasure to look at. It gives to the to the room. I thought when we when I first saw it it would be too big to put into any living room, into any um, ordinary room. Uh, now I can't imagine the room without it. But it has about it this um, uh, assurance and a belief uh, in, in, in a world of, uh, uh, of goodness. I like it very much. This is um, Greek. I think it's um, Mycenae, somewhere in that um, uh, period and area. And it's an example of um, material uh, affecting and being taking its um, part in, in shaping and in making the object. This, to begin with, must have been just a, uh, a roll of, of clay, which the uh, sculptor rolled into his hand, in his hand, then took it and pressed in the middle uh, thinly until he, and he made the round part for the body, worked the little pieces for the breast, nipped it this way for the head, and then round the bottom, which is here, for the, for the base, and produced this um, uh, fundamental, simple, simplified version of the human figure. And then it was decorated. Uh, yes, there's the English um, pot which my wife found, that is something we've had for a long time. Uh, Irina, my wife, found it, I think, in the first year of our marriage, somewhere in 1930, 31, in a, um, uh, uh, a shop, um, a dealer who used to concentrate on um, medieval things. I think this is an example of uh, a period when form, when shape, was a very fundamental uh, instinct with, uh, uh, with the artist, with the people of that time. I like it very much. It's so simple. The big, simple two swellings of shape with the handle joining the two fullnesses. It's, it's a, um, a beautiful object. Again, that's something like the simplicity of Brancusi. This piece was given to me by Dega Rivera <coughs> on my first and only visit to Mexico when I met him. And he knew of my admiration and my, um, even the influence that Mexican sculpture had had on me. Uh, and he had uh, a huge collection of um, Mexican sculpture with several of these, uh, these figures. And uh, when I told him how much I enjoyed and, in fact, had been influenced by such a figure as this, in which, as you'll see, the um, um, the this huge head seems to be supported on a hole, on nothing, but really it's supported by these arches and 
it's a, it, it shows how stone can be hollowed out and you can support huge weights, huge uh, sizes, if the forms come back and connect. It's like on the principle of a Roman arch. This, I think, is a very, um, yes, a very masculine and very powerful piece. Some people find uh, Mexican sculpture, Aztec sculpture in particular, rather cruel. Um, some is. But what I admire about it is this um, tremendous power and strength which it has. This is uh, from, I think, the Congo part of um, Africa. And um, I find it very, um, very impressive indeed. Uh, and I, uh, I think it's an example of where size does count. That if you had a head, a sculpture, of the same quality, almost identical, that is, if it could be reduced to only five or six inches, to life size, you wouldn't be nearly so impressed. And undoubtedly, the um, sculptor made it. It is a dance mask. And it's made to be impressive. Uh, and the size is part of its, uh, its power. Well, this is uh, uh, only two or three years ago that we found it. Um, and um, uh, I didn't and couldn't guess um, where it was from and how old it was. Or, and I still am not sure, but um, uh, I'm told that it's, and I, I can believe that, that it's um, uh, Greek influence uh, of late, latest Greek, but probably from the Middle East. Maybe have some Persian near Persia. But um, uh, those, uh, the, the history of things that, uh, doesn't matter to me, what is it? But I think this is a wonderful example of, of vitality being put from the sculpture into a dead material. Uh, this has got it's such, such a, um, it's a lynx, but it's got such a, uh, such life, this, uh, the bat here is, is so much like what a cat, what that kind of animal, this slackness in here of the, of the, of the loose skin, um, that, um, the, uh, the tautness of the, um, uh, the muscles, the litheness of it all, and the kind of vicious little uh, face, the vicious little, it could, uh, the bite sense of it. It's got it's something uh, tremendously, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, remarkable. Now this is where, in a way, you see, the material, you almost forget it, because the sculptor has been so concerned with capturing, with, with, with reproducing, with getting the, um, uh, the virility and the vitality of the animal that as, as, as marble, but he's kept to the marble. I mean, it, is, it, it still is stone, but it's stone that has been uh, given the, um, uh, the vitality of flesh and of muscle. It's a um, marble that is like this. This is a, um, a recent acquisition, and um, this was given to me because I admired it so much, because ordinarily, some of the later uh, Eskimo sculpture um, done recently is beginning to lose its, um, uh, what? It, its sculptural invention is beginning to uh, be repetitious and being made rather for tourists and so on. But this piece, which perhaps may not be more than 10 or 20 years old, but this piece I think has kept something of that original uh, Eskimo um, vitality. Um, it's also an example of the connection of the material uh, with the finished work. And here, the sculpture is used. It's a whalebone. It's a piece of uh, whalebone. And he's used the natural um, holes in the side of the, I think it may be a, a big um, uh, bone of the, uh, what, what part of the whale, well, I'm not sure. But those two holes on each side are natural. But he's used those, 
uh, in part of his design. And um, I think it has something very uh, powerful and primitive. Uh, well, we have uh, three or four, uh, Rodin. Um, Rodin, I think, is one of the greatest sculptors. Um, after Michelangelo, there's Bernini, Giovanni, Bologna, perhaps um, uh, one or two others, but Rodin uh, certainly um, is one of the greatest after uh, that period. And um, uh, over the years, I think the first one is the striding man uh, has, for me, the real uh, quality that Rodin has of this tense, taut, um, uh, muscular um, what, energy uh, which he gets into his bronzes. So Rodin was a, um, a modeler by instinct, mainly. I think as a young man he did some carving, but uh, the majority of his work is modeled in clay and then cast eventually into bronze. Now, I think the reason why we, we have Degas drawings, two De Degas drawings, again, they're um, uh, acquisitions in the last five or ten years, um, or five years, I think. Um, again, it's, it's their sculptural quality uh, that makes me like them. And um, uh, Degas, for instance, I'm not surprised when certain painters uh, make sculpture and make it very well and do it uh, as good as the sculptors, uh, that um, some of Renoir's figures, for me, are better than my old figures, um, and that um, Degas sculpture is as good uh, quite often as the Rodin sculpture, although he only turned to it late in life. Uh, Domi's sculptures are marvelous. Um, Matisse did sculpture. Picasso does sculpture. Now, all those five or six painters that I've mentioned, in my opinion, are also very great draftsmen. That is, they understand uh, the human figure and its representation in drawing on a, on a flat surface remarkably well, wonderfully. For me, the um, most precious uh, possession, uh, work of art, is the little Cezanne. Uh, this is the first of the ones that I personally, apart from uh, Irina, my wife, uh, liking things and, and getting things, uh, that I might have been mainly instrumental in, in deciding to have. It took me three nights of bad sleeping to decide that um, one could afford to have it or should get it. Uh, I'd seen this painting reproduced, I think in a lecture, thrown up onto a screen and looking uh, 10 feet um, long. And uh, I'd always imagined it from that time as a very big monumental painting. But that when I saw it, as I did, in a gallery in London, and found that it was only this size, uh, it, besides being uh, staggered, I was also realized that it was possible, perhaps, uh, uh, to go on looking at it more than just once in an exhibition. And we did uh, acquire it. What happened nicely since is that um, uh, Kenneth Clark, for my 70th birthday, uh, found and gave me the drawing that I'm sure is, uh, was, done, was made uh, previous to the painting. But um, what impresses me about it, again, is this monumentality. The Degas there is, um, for me, more exciting than the two figures, uh, in a way. Uh, if, if one had to lose one of them, I, I would most regret that. Uh, 
because that again has this marvelous, uh, huge monumentality. And you can see that um, uh, Degas has distorted the forms to emphasize that. The far arm is very much smaller than what in reality it would have looked like. And the, um, uh, the legs, the, the, the whole thing has this wonderful big grandeur. Uh, next to it is the, um, uh, the painting I love too, very much. Uh, the very realistic uh, Kobe, which is a study for uh, the head and shoulder part of the uh, model in the big painting uh, which is in the Louvre of Kobe of the Atelier of his studio. And this, I'm sure, is a study for it. But it's such a fresh um, painting of, um, uh, of uh, such a direct and luscious um, painting of the nude that to me, I, it's absolutely direct, straightforward uh, painting by someone who appreciated uh, the human and the feminine figure enormously. Until very recent times, the human figure has been the main subject with which sculpture has been concerned. Artists in the 20th century have interpreted it with ever-increasing freedom. Moore sees in the human figure many similarities with landscape. This is one of his earliest works. Already he was finding connections between landscape and the monumentality of the body, which he admires so much in Rodin, Degas, Courbet and Cezanne. This is 19... 26 or 7, which is about 45 years ago. And it is one of the first of the reclining figures. I can't remember when the reclining figure as a theme became very, um, uh, what, an, an, an obsession with me. But it was um, already at this time. Uh, this particular sculpture is in uh, concrete, and it was an experiment of casting in concrete, apart from the making of it. As you'll see, it's a very simple figure. And I could make the cast in two halves. And if, from where I am, there's the um, cast joint down here. I made this half and that half of the mold, turned it upside down, and filled it with concrete. And the figure came out much better than I expected as a cast. Um, but um, it's one that I still. Uh, I still like. This is very much the, um, uh, the kind of solid, uh, concentrated, uh, simplified massing that is the obvious thing about um, carved sculpture. And this was a carved sculpture idea, but I didn't have the material to carve it, so I did it in clay. The reclining figure is a conventional sculptural theme. But this work, made in 1931, is something much more complex and surrealist. It was one of Moore's first sculptural metaphors. Well, this um, was, for me, an important um, stage of my development as a sculptor, because although I was still mainly a stone sculptor, in fact, uh, completely uh, absorbed in stone carving, I was dissatisfied with the um, uh, usual idea of direct carving in which the forms are all so uh, embedded in each other that they don't have a free, independent existence. And here I was trying to make, so that, say, this form, which is like the shape of an egg, which is the body, is completely, almost completely realized, though not separated from the rest. That is that I was making the forms um, realized enough and yet compact enough. It was a very um, uh, important stage in my uh, development as a sculptor. Also, I was in this uh, getting the freedom to um, uh, mix forms, uh, the forms of one thing with the forms of another, and yet perhaps making a unit, kind of organic unit, um, out, of the, uh, out of the whole. And this I've done um, at later times. I mean, here is the back view of a figure. This is a kind of, uh, of egg. This is the sort of um, head. And it has, the whole has some sort of sense of a jug. But um, it is an organic 
uh, form. And I remember a little child, my nie nie niece, I think, who was very young, when she first saw this, she said, oh, an elephant in an armchair, <laughs> which was a, uh, I was very pleased that she had felt some uh, real object, some real um, uh, person. Well, this is a sculpture with three points, which um, also led to a whole lot of, um, of other sculptures based on this idea of uh, things nearly touching, uh, because the point draws your attention to it, like a cross does in a, um, in a picture, X marks the spot. The points, too, come together. And um, this had been an idea of mine to uh, do it, but it has some connection, or it can have a connection with the human sense. And as I made this sculpture, I remembered and into my mind came the Michelangelo, the creation uh, in the Sistine Chapel painting, where the um, Adam is being touched, or the finger of um, the creator is touching Adam, and you feel that there's some uh, connection, something passing between the two. But also, too, there's that picture uh, from, uh, is it the Fontainebleau School, where um, two sisters and one is sitting next to the other and just about to touch the nipple of the other one. And the same kind of thing, that very um, almost um, tense moment, just that touching. So there's a human sense to it too. I mean, like sparking plugs and so on. Yes, it, it's very full of, of connection. It is a human form thing. One one thing just touching or about to touch another one. Well, I think this is um, not the first of the helmet heads that I did. The first, I think, is somewhere around 1939 or 40. Um, and that developed, even that developed from an idea of one form uh, enclosing another and protecting it, as a helmet is um, a protection for the human soft human form to protect it. Um, and uh, once I got that idea, it recurred because it's a very um, fruitful and fundamental idea. One could have made a whole uh, career out of just making the forms inside other forms. Um, but I seem to come back to that idea every few years. And um, uh, this was made, I think, in 1950. Um, and it is this mystery, too, that you get by the form being enclosed by another one. You don't disclose it entirely, and it's hidden, but comes back gradually as you go round. The armor idea is this hard uh, covering or shell to something inside it. Um, and it is like, uh, it's the same idea as a shell uh, of, a, uh, of a crab or a lobster or a um, snail, protecting a very vulnerable form inside it. Uh, it, is a, it. It is a fundamental form idea. So I've done um, many mother and child sculptures, and most of them have been this idea of the larger form, uh, a relationship with the smaller form and the protective sense and the sense of, um, what, of, um, uh, of, of gentleness and, uh, and of um, uh, tenderness. But this isn't always so with, 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 with um, um, youth and uh, age. It isn't always so with, with, with um, very young uh, children or animals. They're ravenous. They're kind of almost, it's as though they want to devour their parents and their, um, their need for food and for growing is such that um, their parent has no, they have no tender feelings towards the parent. Sometimes the parent has almost to protect itself. And the, here's uh, a, um, the opposite side to what I usually did uh, in my mother and child idea. And I wanted this to seem as though the child was trying to devour uh, its parent 
and as though the parent, the mother, had to hold the child at arm's length. This is the sculpture that I made after the um, drawings and the etchings uh, that I did from the elephant skull. It's the result, it's the sculpture which is based, though not a copy of an elephant skull, but based on the kind of ideas uh, that I got out of it. Uh, that is that the lower piece, like the lower jaw, that is a sculpture in two pieces. The top part is like the top part of the skull, the lower part is like the jaw that holds the top part of the skull. But um, also, of course, it, it includes um, ideas from my other sculptures. That is from uh, one's other experience, past experience. And there's the points here, like um, in the 1940 points. Uh, but um, perhaps this is much more uh, what I got out of the elephant skull was this inside, the interior and the change that you get as you go around it. The enormous variety that there was in the elephant skull, I tried to get to some extent um, in this. This sculpture is made of fiberglass. It's in two parts. It would be impossible to carve in marble. The points would slip and break. Moore has exhibited the separate parts cast in highly polished bronze. There was a time when he developed ideas about truth to material. Now his attitude is much more flexible. Sculpture can be made by modelling as well as carving. The model is often made in plaster. These maquettes are then measured and enlarged to any scale. The final full-size sculpture is cast from the model in the material the artist chooses, so plaster may turn to bronze. The material has changed. Now, all the maquettes I make, more or less, in the same material, that is plaster. Because plaster, you can mix it and build on it and cut it down. Um, and you can leave it alone for a month and it doesn't change. You can go back, uh, wet it down and add to it and alter it. It is a, uh, a sensible and useful, for me, material. Uh, and often those maquettes, if I want to preserve them, get cast into bronze because bronze is a casting material. Nobody works direct in bronze. You see, this is a... In people talking about truth to material, they never talk about truth to bronze. Now I believe that the material is secondary to the idea. And, um, but perhaps, in my case, I did carving for 20 years, mainly. Um, and for that reason, I think I can now imagine a sculpture, and I can design or think of a sculpture in stone, and I can do things with it that I wouldn't have dared to do as a young person. Um, this I learned to some extent early on by seeing, say, the um, Cycladic sculptures, where you'll have a seated figure in which everything is pierced. And I remember seeing the small Cycladic figure about this big in um, the um, Athens Museum. And the sculptors of that period, 3000 BC, could not have had bronze tools before the Bronze Age. They must have carved with other stones harder than the one they were using and then have rubbed. And yet they pierced and got behind. They've made this open work seated figure playing a harp uh, in a hard material. This is wonderful. Uh, that, that is, they were not frightened of the material. That early period of direct carving used to result in a lot of sculpture, which was all tied up in itself, all as though it was a pressed lard against into a square box. This is not uh, sculpture. There are certain um, um, restrictions. You shouldn't, the sculptor should not be a slave to the material. He should be the master of the material. I think I've said this somewhere before, but not a cruel master. Moore's crowded studios are the evidence of such mastery. The walls enclose a large gathering of familiars, the companions of 50 years of his working life. He has kept a casting of every bronze that he has made, many original carvings, and of course the full-scale models on which he worked. He has given many things to museums, including the Tate Gallery in London, who have the largest collection. Many of the solid plaster models, which are, after all, his originals, bearing the marks of his own hand, 
are being given to the National Gallery of Ontario. A special museum has been built for them in Toronto. Moore remains a countryman at heart. His studios are surrounded by fields, hedges and woods. He is happiest seeing his sculpture in the open air. Eventually, these gentle acres will be given to the nation and administered by the Tate Gallery. His work will be seen as he wants it to be seen, in the countryside where it was born, around the studios from which it came. Meanwhile, the place is his own and his work goes on. But as for what the next idea will be, of course, what the only one doesn't know. No. No artist ever retires or gives up in the sense that the businessman thinks that he's done, done enough and therefore he takes it easy. There isn't such a thing. It's all part of, um, I mean, that, that's how you're made. I love uh, the outdoors. I love landscape. I love trees. I love... Um, but if I'd been brought up entirely in, in a city and only, only seen the inside of rooms, you'd still have in the streets, you'd still have this sense of, uh, of scale and of relationship of the person with the, with the environment. Um, it's just that I prefer a, um, a uh, nature. Um, and anyhow, on the whole, I prefer nature to man-made um, environment. For the present, the most appropriate tribute to Moore's vision is in a Scottish glen. The British tradition in painting and poetry has often been about man and nature. This feeling was at the heart of all that Constable, Turner and Wordsworth believed. It has been Moore's achievement to add the art of sculpture to this tradition. The ever-changing nature of the British climate, the softness of the moist light in an island caught between the North Sea and the Atlantic, has not always encouraged sculptural sensibility. Moore's work is a triumphant affirmation of the power of sculpture to take on new meanings with every change of natural mood. It stands majestic in the landscape, imbued with life and mystery. Since ancient times, men have made monuments in human form and placed them on the land in which they live. Moore's sculptures express a deep human response to the beauty and the wildness of the natural world. 